We became conscious of Brazil when a man with a mustache quit power two months ago. Cuba is gone. Brazil goes, so goes South America. There was a time when Brazil meant carnival in Rio. Women. And Latin rhythm. Soaring peaks, where Rio de Janeiro, the river of January, meets the sea. The soft, eternal sun. And Copacabana, where life is forever. But now, Brazil has come to mean crisis, too. A vast human quarrel with overtones of mass revolt. One leading Latin American statesman has said, the greatest upheaval in history is brewing today in South America. Fired by the energy of human pride called nationalism, the upheaval has started in Brazil. This is a report on a country and a contradiction. On a past era that should be dead, but is still very much alive. On the present that has scarcely arrived, but is already bursting into the future. We think that you should, you Americans, should have done with us in Brazil the same thing that Russia has done with China, with communist China. Because if you had helped us, as Russia has helped communist China, progress in Brazil and the standard of living will be much higher. Now, it is true that uh, in comparative account, the United States did more for Europe and the results uh, are visible all over the continent of Western Europe now. It is true that in Southeast Asia we did a good deal. Uh, and by comparative standards, more might have done for Latin America. But fundamentally, that is our concern. It is not cause for complaint. I think the basic reforms we have to go through is the land reform, the educational reform, the financial reform, and the institutional reform, that is, a new statute of political parties. Is it fair to say that these reforms will have to come in Brazil or else... Or else this country will explode. CBS News correspondent, Eric Severide. When Cuba erupted into communism, we asked ourselves, why? Why did it happen? Could we have prevented it? The post-mortem is endless, the hindsight ample. It is time for foresight, because Brazil is growling and rumbling with potential explosion. Brazil, ten times the size and importance of Cuba, her territory, one half that of all South America, bigger than the United States, minus Alaska. For 70 million people, nearly one half the population of the whole southern continent. Brazil, always our most dependable ally to the south. Old, worn, and cynical, and at the same time, young, fresh, and idealistic. A people demanding to know their identity in the world, and who may find it in neutrality, whether the United States likes it or not. When Fidel Castro came to power, and Cuba veered toward the communist camp, Latin America became a big story. It became a big story again when on August 25th, after only seven months in office, Brazil's quixotic president, Janios, the white knight of honest government, unhorsed himself. He resigned, shocking his country and surprising the world. He had fired the crooked and incompetent, installed time clocks in government offices, squeezed business to slow down inflation, cut spending, told the military to stay out of politics. He set the stage to renew diplomatic relations with the Soviet bloc, treated the United States with cool indifference, and got more aid from us than ever. The largest foreign aid package in Latin American history. Two billion dollars in new financing. And our Secretary of the Treasury, Douglas Dillon, said of him, I certainly am fully confident that uh, President Quadros uh, intends to uh, 
uh, initiate the right kind of action that uh, will uh, uh, bring, if it is allowed to continue over the next, successfully over the next four or five years, will put Brazil uh, on a sound uh, economic path and will enable her to recover from the inflation which uh, has characterized the last three or four years in Brazil. They call Quadros the only alternative to communism. The country was his oyster, yet without warning or notice, he threw it away. Why? Some said he was emotionally unstable. Some said he was plotting to supersede the Congress. Some said it was frustration. Afonso Arenos, Jr., a strong Quadro supporter. He wanted to realize something. He wanted to do, to make something, some reforms. And not being able to do so, he to do so, he preferred to resign. Adolf Burley, former Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America and once U.S. Ambassador to Brazil. I think probably he was finding that the congressional opposition to some of his measures increasingly handicapped him in some of the things he wished to do. And uh, there was also a very considerable disagreement with his foreign policy, which was rather slanted towards a kind of Nazarism. Quadros boarded a ship for Europe and hid away in London. He said he would return. Quadros himself said he had been defeated by forces of reaction, foreign and domestic. He did not elaborate. What kind of a country did Quadros inherit from his predecessors? What had he left behind? He inherited and tried to break the political tradition of Getulio Vargas, dictator and president who ruled the country for nearly two decades till scandal in his administration and pressure from the army caused him to put a bullet in his heart in 1954. Vargas dead became a martyr and a myth, a symbol of the struggle of Brazil's poor people for land and bread. His successor was Juscelino Kubitschek, president from 55 to 60, who brought constitutional government, industrial boom, and a fierce inflation and whose name and face are carved on the cornerstone of the fantastic new capital city of Brasilia. Glittering and glaring at the barren wilderness like a newly arrived mechanism on the moon. A future without a past, a city of no memories and no shadows. Roofless, treeless, devoid of nooks and crannies or shady lanes. Not designed to accommodate ivy or absorb the twilight. We will make 50 years progress in five, said former President Kubitschek, and spend 50 years paying for the five, said his critics. Kubitschek built Brasilia, he opened the interior, he built highways, railroads, steel plants, refineries, dams, and auto industry. He went for broke and got there. He left to President Quadros a foreign debt of about three and a half billion dollars, a domestic debt of a half a billion, and 40 million bags of unsold coffee. Brazilian historian Gilberto Freire has this to say of Brasilia. What was done uh, in Brasilia from this point of view amounts, I fear, to the proportions of a crime against the Brazilian people. Most of the Brazilian people are suffering today on account of Brasilia. Many disbelieved in Brasilia at the start now nearly everyone knows this city must succeed. If Brasilia fails, then the newfound expansionist spirit of the people could fail. The dream of Brazil, as an industrialized, developed, self-respecting world power, could seep away in this dry red earth, and the giant could go back to sleep again. If Brasilia is symbol of the boundless future, it is also symbol of the anxious present. Its building has been abruptly slowed down by the raging inflation that Brasilia itself has partly caused. Thomas Romanat is a prominent American businessman working in Brazil. I have been here for 15 years and I have seen inflation here for 15 years and I see inflation for the next 15 years. You do? You don't think it will be stopped? No, I think that the government of Brazil, even if they slow it down to about 10 to 15 percent per year, would be a, a, a tremendous accomplishment. Not since Germany in the 20s or China in the 40s has the world seen an inflation like this one. 
Last year, living costs shot up another 40%. The very poor suffer the most. They go late in the morning to the daily market, get the leftovers when prices have dropped. Beans, 48 cruzeros for two pounds. Rice, 44. Dried meat, 190. When the wage for millions of peasants is 70 to 90 cruzeros a day. On a gas station pump, the centavo figures, the cents, whirl by. Nobody figures in pennies anymore. If inflation is a symptom rather than a cause of unsolved problems, as Castro may be called a symptom of Cuba's failure to solve its problems, then the causes continue after Quadros as they existed for generations before his time. One Brazilian politician has said, if the economic picture was difficult in Quadros' time, it has now become impossible. Inflation may be the current curse, but behind that is the fundamental tragedy of the country. Brazil is being pulled in two. There is the Northeast, a vast area of sickness, squalor, and brewing revolt. Life and death at five cents an hour. There is the South, where millionaires are manufactured on the assembly line. First, the South, the Latin miracle. The showcase of date of Sao Paulo, fashionable address of the ambitious, successful, admired, and resented polistas. Here is the engine that makes Brazil work, the biggest industrial center in all Latin America, the fastest growing city in the world, now over four million people. This city has Cisco, clean, white, and graceful. It sits high on a plateau. The air is sharp and dry. Here a man may work hard and play hard, and believe in the future for his children and for his country. The real importance of Sao Paulo is its huge middle class, thousands of businessmen, large and small, a million and a half comfortable wage earners, people with purchasing power, the backbone of a modern consumer economy. Sao Paulo's coffee-rich countryside provides more than half the nation's export wealth, a vital legal tender known as foreign exchange. Yet even here, the conveyor belt and load-bearing human head meet, typifying the contradiction that is Brazil. Coffee made it rich, plus sugar, cotton, and cattle. That money generated industry. Today, there are some 54,000 plants and factories in this one state, a new one every week. One-third of all Brazilian income is earned right here. This state pays nearly half of all Brazil's taxes. Its workers earn nearly twice the national average. The wealth spreads and the suburbs grow, like any from Flatbush to West Los Angeles. This one is called Brooklyn Polista, a trolley ride to the downtown shopping centers. By night as by day, a roaring metropolis. Department stores open every Thursday night till nine. Television channels flourishing. These cities of the South, Sao Paulo, Rio, Porto Alegre, tend to keep the Northeast poor, drawing down the best brains from the North, drawing down Northern capital for quick profits in real estate, selling supplies to the North at higher and higher prices. In the Northeast, the poor seek food, and some surcease from this life's misery in their ancient African religious rites. In the South, the rich seek distractions. Debutantes perform classic Portuguese dances as a highly skilled hobby. Sao Paulo, pride of Brazil, envy of Brazil, and stranger to Brazil. Closer in spirit to New York, Paris, or Rome, than to Recife, Bahia, or Fortaleza. 5,000 Americans live here, operating about a billion dollars in U.S. investments. More in this one state than we have in any other Latin American country except Venezuela. More than we had in all of Cuba. American and other foreign firms in Brazil pay their taxes. By authoritative estimate, nine out of 10 Brazilian firms keep two sets of books, one for the tax collector. Many millions of dollars in private Brazilian earnings lie in banks outside of Brazil. Thank you.
A thousand miles away to the northeast lies the largest area of human blight in the Western Hemisphere. This is the sound of feudalism, where the Mediterranean ox cart, unchanged since the 16th century, echoes the groaning of the half-numbed human spirit. This is a sugar plantation near the town of Cabo in the northeast state of Pernambuco, where 2% of the people own 50% of the land, where the 2% own the tools, the votes, the law, and own the peasants in all but the legal sense, where abundant human hands come cheaper than tractors. It's reminiscent of the plantation system of the Old South in the United States before the Civil War. 400 years ago, the Portuguese brought slavery to their colony, Brazil. Later, Brazil won its independence, and in 1888, slavery was abolished. The former slaves remained on the land as feudal serfs. Rain, heat, mud, and the all-pervading sick smell of the sugar refinery. Everywhere, the ancient odor of feudal life. This is the face of feudalism, the peasant, whose life reflects the system of low productivity, of high death rates and low energy rates, of illiteracy, disease, and child labor. His normal dinner is black beans and manioc, a meal ground from a common root. Celso Furtado, head of the Northeast Development Agency, describes the condition of the peasants. They earn, let's say, in average, 70 cruceros a day. About 30 cents American. That's true. Well, if you take into account that they pay 200 cruceros a kilo of dried meat, you have an idea of how much money they earn. Three days pay just for uh, two pounds of meat. Two pounds of meat. How, when do they start work? Is it true that uh, young boys and girls are already like grown up working people? Yes, as yes, young boys, let's say 10 years old, 11 years old, they do not used to go to the school at all. And they start working usually at 11 years old. And they live, I would say, up to 30 years old, because they, usually they do not live more than 30 years. They are plantation workers. Because they have a small plot of land, very small indeed, let's say one-tenth of an acre. When they receive the house and the small plot of land, they are at the same time obliged to work every day in the big plantation. But if they are so... Uh weak and badly fed. This must be uneconomic for a plantation owner, isn't it? Well, that is a, is a vicious circle. They do not work very hard, indeed, because they have no energy at all. And they do not work because they do not eat, eat enough. And they do not eat enough because they do not get money to pay for. That's a vicious circle. In a country feeling the growing pains of modern development, feudalism is heavy on its back. The largest sugar plantation in the Northeast is the Eusina Catende. The Costa Azaveda is its owner. It has been in his family for generations. I have heard it said that many peasants do not work hard because they don't have enough food to eat each day. Is that true in your experience? No. My experience is, and this is the experience of those that lead with big industry like mine, that if you give uh, an interest, a bigger interest, to these people that work in the country. And he finds that working two or three days in the week, he earns su sufficient to maintain himself and his family the rest of the week. Then he don't work the next three days. They have no stimulus of saving. They need to be educated for that. They are ignorant, and they have no stimulus for a better living, for saving some money to live better. Historian and sociologist Gilberto Freire says, The fact is that before the abolition of slavery, uh, the slaves 
who were then the laborers in this part of Brazil and in other parts of Brazil too, lived a better life than most peasants in this part of Brazil especially live since the abolition of slavery. Nobody takes care of the peasants now. The uh, owners of the modern uh, sugar mills do not do this, and the governor has not been able to do this, and the clergy has not done this, because some of the political leaders of Brazil uh, were always postponing a solution for this problem, and that may be explained to, uh, by the fact that some of the uh, political leaders themselves are connected uh, with the ownership of lands. Abraham Lincoln said, a nation cannot long endure half free and half slave. In today's world, Brazil cannot long endure half modern and half feudal. If Quadros were Kennedy and this country consisted of an industrial complex on one coast and the mass misery of an Asiatic state on the other, we might grasp the problem such a president has to face. We fought a bloody civil war to bridge the gap. Brazil be able to avoid it. Gilberto Freire. There will be not only be impossible to go on with a progressive Brazil in the southern part of it and uh, an archaic and uh, neglected Brazil in this region. An archaic feudalist system cannot absorb the pressures of today's population explosion. People increase faster than arable acres. So leave this land by tens of thousands. Along the highways of the Northeast, a common sight, the migrant peasant families waiting for a ride to nowhere. In the city of Recife, the communist stronghold of the Northeast, the migrant peasants crowd the grass roof that cover the swampy, low-tide wastelands of the city. 400,000 people, half the population of the city, live this way. Jobs are scarce, almost non-existent for illiterate, unskilled former peasants. Food is scarce. Combing the dump heaps becomes a daily occupation. Scavenging for spoiled potatoes. Tiny crabs can be gathered at low tide in the mud flats of the rivers that flow through the city, and thousands live on them. There are new industries, new schools, new hospitals, but they are re-swamped every year or so by the swelling population. In the new capital, Brasilia, job-seeking northeastern people drag to this spot their ancient miseries. The newest city in the world with the highest per capita slum population of any city of the world. In elegant Rio de Janeiro, playland for the rich, haven for the corrupt, and a squatting ground for the poor, the migrating northeasterners infest the favelas, the hillside slums. One is another place. The people have no amusements on a Sunday afternoon except one another. The city provided the water spout. All day, water is carried where water doesn't flow without pipes, uphill. All this a stone's throw from the elegant villas of the rich and within the embrace of the spirit that has room for rich and poor alike. The governor of the state of Guanabara, which includes the city of Rio, is Carlos Lacerda. We have more than 900,000 people living in slums in a population of more than 3,200,000. And uh, it's very hard to speak about freedom and uh, joys of Christian civilization to people who do not have water in their homes and schools for their children. The poverty is a most difficult fact is the existence of Castro Cuba and its influence called Fidelismo. It 
is written on the wall. Cuba is our example. Long live Cuba. Long live Fidel. The banner reads, the fight of the Cuban people is our fight. In Brazil, the communists cannot run their own candidates for office, but they can do everything else. And in the cities, they are blatantly on the offensive. They organize rallies, such as this one in Karuaru, a city in the northeast. But as you will witness in this rally, the when communism has aroused Brazilians in who have organized break-up communist demonstrations. A local official prepares the crowd. The speaker says, why say that Fidel Castro is abandoned? He is carrying out land reform. He is dispossessing the American sugar producers. We must do the same. By 8 o'clock, 5,000 people turned up in the old church square. So did 50 anti-Castro students from the local university. Their purpose, to break up this demonstration of Brazilian support for Castro in Cuba. Their chant was, Brazil first. The crowd stood by, expecting trouble, not wanting to get involved, not wanting to go away. Symbolic of the general temper of the people and the time. The police stood by, not stopping the meeting, not stopping the students. Students in Brazil enjoy an almost limitless immunity, whatever their political persuasion. They seem to be untouchable. The communist speaker called in vain for police protection. We are in a constitutionally democratic country. We are living in a democracy, he says. The only way we shall leave here is as dead bodies. We are in a country democratic. Eventually, he calls for help from the crowd. I appeal to the working class, to the members of the Communist Party of this city, to maintain order as adherents of Fidel Castro do in their great Caribbean Republic. But in the end, the speaker's stand was taken by the students and the rally ended in a riot. 100 miles away, another rally in the city of Recife. A labor rally here is part carnival, part demonstration. Miguel Arres, the mayor of Recife, an admirer of Castro and, some say, of communism. In the next election, Mayor Arez will run for a new office. He has a good chance of winning, may well be the next governor of the state of Pernambuco, the first socialist governor in Brazil. To head off political upheaval in the Northeast, the government has a long-term program of development. Dams, new roads, new industries, new irrigation projects, most of it still on paper. This is Apollo Afonso hydroelectric station. One key to the plan, the main source of power for the whole nine state region. It is a race, hope of progress against spreading despair, and time is rapidly running out. Brazil has become a propaganda battleground. Castro's Cuba has polarized the struggle for the soul of Brazil. Should Brazil go his way with the promise or the illusion of quick results, or continue the slow way of democratic reform while life for a good many millions gets worse. How we handle Cuba itself will have a lot to do with the outcome. The meaning and the disposition of Castro's Cuba divides Brazilian universities, 
labor unions, political parties, and at the University of Sao Paulo Law School, student leaders argue this matter incessantly. The men from the country. We believe that anyway, if you... Castro is a result of that mistake of the United States and that mistake of Batista. I really believe that the United States has not the whole duty. He's not guilty at all in that thing. He is guilty. The uh, United States is guilty. But, a little but bit, not no, 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 not all the guilty, but half. Yeah. James, I believe that half. And I believe that uh, the states did that mistake. It was interference of American investors in Cuba, American groups, American money, American interests in Cuba that made the United States support Ca uh, Batista until a certain point. When the situation got a little explosive, when the situation got a little explosive, uh, the, the states stopped a little to support Batista and gave some guns and some weapons to Castro. Yes. Firstly, he represented Cuba. Okay. The people of, the people of Cuba. But then he betrayed his revolution. The only problem is that Fidel, he began wanting something good for Cuba. After he began without knowing, he fell on the communists' uh, way of thinking. And now he can't get out. So he works uh, like, a, like a doll in the hand of the communists Do now. We here. We help him to get out? I think we would uh, find a diplomatical way of changing his mind. That's what I think. We should make an organization of the American states. A blockage against Cuba. No, 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 no not, not this. this. An organization of American states. And ask Cuba to come and discuss with us their problems and our problems. And any violence that the United States commits against Cuba we wouldn't like that. And uh, from now on, from that moment on, the United States would be taken as an imperialist country and uh, all the arguments that communism is in using in Latin America will be taken seriously. Yes. We asked Carlos Lacerda how he thought we should handle Cuba. Well, I don't want to sound too cynic, but I think if you wanted to invade, you should do it in the recent past, but do it successfully. Would you recommend we try it the again? The trouble with it is that you tried to help an invasion, you tried badly, and you tried uh, timidly. And we put us in facing a terrible situation. To approve an uh, intervention was ill-prepared and badly done. But as to the principle of intervening in a communist state of Cuba, you do not oppose intervention as such. I, personally, and this is just a personal point of view, I, uh, if I had to ca call intervention the help to Cubans to give freedom to their own country, then I would, in the days of last uh, Second World War, I would be against helping the goal to free France. Uh, it's ba basically the same situation. Should I call intervention the help you gave to the goal? Labor Deputy Bocayuva da Cunha. If American troops are sent against Fidel Castro, you are going to have the whole country of Brazil. You are going to have the whole country, I say, and I'm not exaggerating, supporting Fidel Castro. Gilberto Freire has this to say of Castro. I don't see uh, the danger of Castro becoming uh, a, such a fascinating figure that his influence will spread to, to Latin America. Uh, I think that the danger in Cu Cuba is more of another kind. It's more a danger to the security of the continent from the point of view of the uh, recent relations that seem to have been developing between Castro and uh, communist powers. I think that's the real danger. Not uh, a sort of influence of Castro over the continent. Uh, he began to be 
greatly admired as a romantic figure of a leader who was uh, going against American big business, not against the United States, but against American big, big business. And from that point of view, he was greatly admired and esteemed by many Latin Americans. But as soon as he began to be uh, the leader of a communist, or quasi-communist, almost communist government in, in Cuba, he has lost, I think, a great part of the admirations that he had in Brazil and in other parts of Latin America. Suppose the United States decided it had to invade Cuba and put an end to Castro. What would be the effect in this part of the world? I think there would be resentment, considerable resentment, because then Cuba would cease to be the kingdom of Castro and would become a Latin American nation invaded by the colossus of the north, by the Anglo-Saxon colossus of the north. And uh, that would arouse a sort of Latin solidarity between the uh, American nations. There would be resentment. Why, with all her natural wealth, her gifted people, is Brazil in critical condition? Is it America's fault, as many Brazilians like to say? Is it Brazil's fault, as few Americans seem willing to say? Blame nature first. Solid jungle covers millions of acres, and man has not yet found efficient ways to extract the wealth of jungles. The mountains slice the land in jagged patchwork, setting people in pockets of isolation. Blame history, a past of slavery, a prolonged colonial state of mind. But, say some Brazilians, blame also the American and European businessman for whom Brazil once was bonanza land. The left wing claims it still is. Deputy Bocaiuva. We think that through private capital, we can't raise the standard of living of Brazil. We have a very bad experience of private capital. We don't want foreign capital to come here to make a quick profit and go back. But if you want to make government-to-government -government loans, if you want really to help us, we are going to receive you with our arms open. You think that too much profit is shipped out of the country then? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. What percentage that, of that the are the numbers. There are American companies that had made here in the last 10 years things like 200% a year, 300% a year, even 1,000% a year of their capital. American businessman Thomas Romanach disagrees. As I see it, American company, American businessmen have come to Brazil to make a profit, yes, but also to make a contribution in giving employment to a large number of Brazilians and also uh, giving them know-how that they haven't got. When it comes to the profit that they're here to make, they have remitted less than half of what they have earned. Uh, they are 58, 59, for example, years that American uh, investments uh, made a profit here of about 7%. The remittances were less than 3.5%, in fact, closer to 3%. Deputy Bocaiuva, would you want your country to end its special relation with the United States? and adopt a different foreign policy position, neutralist or independent? Uh, those words are very uh, dangerous, in my opinion. We want the Brazilian foreign policy to be Brazilian. We want to put the Brazilian interest before everything. It's Brazil. up to you to do that, isn't it? And we are going to do that. Haven't you been free to do that up till now? Yes, we were. But unfortunately, for many, many years, the elite, the Brazilian elite, has been thinking in terms, not very much Brazilian terms. They have been thinking in other terms. You're not saying here, are you, that the basic social and economic troubles of Brazil are the fault of the United States of America? Oh, no, we are not saying that. The blame is up to us. We are the ones to have to solve our problems. But we think of the United States, of how much you could help us of how much you could have helped us if you haven't put always the interest of the private capital before the interest 
of really helping a friend, a big country, and a good people. Former U.S. Ambassador to Brazil, Adolf Burley, speaking as a private citizen. The uh, fact is that American business in the main, in the last generation in Latin America, has behaved itself uh, very well. The real complaint, strangely enough, uh, if it were well made, uh, frequently isn't, is something quite different. It is not a lack of uh, desire to have American business there, save in the pro-communist quarters. There, of course, is a real hostility. The real complaint is that uh, we should pay higher prices for their goods and that we should sell our goods to them at a lower price. I do not think that any Latin American has uh, gone to bed worrying whether his independence was in danger. And uh, I can state from the record that every Latin American government that found itself in economic difficulties found no difficulty in coming immediately to Washington and asking for help. Now, they've had, by absolute standards, a great deal. And I think the nonsense ought to stop. When Johnny O'Quadros resigned as president last August, some said he had emotionally collapsed. Others said it was a maneuver to come back with greater powers. In any case, his abrupt act electrified and dismayed the nation and brought it to the verge of civil war. His vice president, Jean Goulart, an old guard Vargas Kivacek man, was on a mission to Red China, seeking markets for Brazilian goods. Suddenly, he found himself president of a country that wouldn't let him come home. To the military leaders of Brazil, Goulart was worse than Quadros because of his willingness to do business with communists abroad and accept their support at home. War Minister Odilio Deni swore to block his return. The country and the Congress split on the issue. Some wanted Goulart, some wanted Quadros back, some wanted neither. Congress feared a military dictatorship. A deputy named Fernando Ferrari spoke for a good many when he said, I will fight for Goulart until the day he is inaugurated. Then I will fight against him. In the southern state of Rio Grande do Sul, governed by Leonel Brizolo, Goulart's brother-in-law, the campaign for Goulart's return became a family affair. The Third Army, garrisoned in the state, broke with the national commander to support Goulart and the Constitution. Cowboys and housewives in the Gaucho state signed up for the democratic resistance. The southern capital of Porto Alegre bristled with defiance as the forces of legality prepared to fight in the street. Congress, in some embarrassment, agreed to revise the Constitution and cut the powers of the president if the military leaders would let Goulart take office. Governor Carlos Lacerda was one of the few political leaders to stand with the military. I don't think they were against uh, the Constitution. But under our Constitution, the Army, Air Force, and Navy are supposed to be the guardians of internal order and of national security. In such capacity, they warned the Congress that the coming of Vice President Goulart in the presidency, because of his entanglements and commitments with the communists, would endanger uh, national security. It was up to the Congress to decide if they were right or wrong. Actually, the Congress decide, decided that they were half right and half wrong. They changed the regime, started a parliamentary regime, and put Goulart in the presidency. This is a typical Brazilian compromise. After 14 days of political strife, near civil war, and a leaderless country, Jean Goulart was allowed to return, and on September 7 was inaugurated, ostensibly, a figurehead president. He would answer none of our questions, but he made this statement. A política exterior do novo governo brasileiro. The foreign policy of the new Brazilian government is based on absolute independence, true to our traditions and commitments, always inspired in our respect to the sovereignty of all states through the principles of non-intervention and self-determination of countries. Our foreign policy is not underlined by ideological prejudice or bias against any nation. 
The words may sound different from the prickly directness of Quadros, but the policy sounds the same. Deputy Bokayuva, himself a leader in Goulart's Labor Party, elaborates to Charles Kurov. We have already many reasons to believe that uh, we are going to establish, re-establish relationship, diplomatic and commercial, with the United uh, Republic of Soviet Union. We are going to vote for the admission of the continental China subject on the agenda of the United Nations. And I hope that we vote too for the admission of continental China on the United Nations. We are going to support the right of the Cuban people to stay with the kind of government they want. Are you willing to accept communist support? Oh, of course we are. Of course we are. If the uh, Communist Party, who is illegal in Brazil, but uh, who has uh, influence in many areas of opinion, if they want to give us public support in the reforms we need for Brazil, then we are. Don't you think there is some danger of the Communist Party taking over your program? Oh, absolutely. The Communist Party in Brazil is uh, nothing, you see. It, uh, it only exists in the, in the proportion of the stupidity, of the blindness of the elite who doesn't want to see that they can't not maintain in such a big and powerful country their privilege and their positions without giving to the people, to the masses of the people, their minimum needs. The prime minister under the new parliamentary system technically holds most executive powers. He is the middle of the road, former Vargas Minister of Justice, Tancredo Neves. He underlined the words of the president. The independent line which Brazil has adopted in relation to its foreign policy should not be interpreted as being hostile to U.S. policy. Brazil, as a result of its size and its material and cultural progress, is prepared to occupy its rightful position in the civilized world. It has simply stopped being a dependent nation. But he went a step further in reassuring the United States. We do not want to go counter to the values of the democratic world. In fact, we will do everything within our power not to renounce these values. Tancredo Neves, the first prime minister of Brazil in this century, may also be the last. There is no certainty the parliamentary system will work or that its government can carry out the reforms so vital to the country's survival. Adolf Burley. I think it is fair to say that uh, a transitional government like this one does lose a lot of momentum. This makes it difficult for it to act with the uh, uh, drive and effectiveness uh, that a centralized government could have. On the other hand, of course, it protects Brazil from uh, the uh, kind of uh, adventurism towards dictatorship which it saw 20 or 30 years ago. Should we go ahead and give Brazil this foreign aid package of a great many millions of dollars? For the time being, I think we should. I do not think that the policy of the uh, next government has yet been fully defined. I do think this. I think that in fairness to ourselves and to everyone else, we should make it clear that uh, no foreign aid can be useful or fruitful where the uh, government of the country concerned desires to be an enemy of the United States or desires to oppose the common national interests we all of us have or desires to assist communist imperialism and take for Latin America or which desires to give the impression that American foreign aid is the result of uh, a blackmailing opposition. The, uh, theory that uh, in Latin American politicians can uh, be as uh, unpleasant to the United States as they can, at the same time get foreign aid and then represent to their people that by being unpleasant to the United States they have somehow blackmailed or otherwise induced the United States to pay them tribute is a tragic illusion and uh, it ought to stop. If Brazil cannot make it the democratic way, then the chance for other South American countries is not very great. We would have a monumental mess on our doorstep, and Cuba would seem a minor matter.
Brazilians say we have taken their friendship too much for granted. They have taken our help and protection too much for granted. If we must keep Brazil on our mind, as we must, we need not keep her on our conscience. Kubitschek made many new economic starts, but an industrial foundation was laid. Quadros made many new political starts toward honest, efficient government. He got off. He failed and quit, but an example was made. The people will not forget or forgive. If the new parliamentary regime fails in the forward drive, another strong man will take over, because he will have to. Retreat now means certain chaos and a country broken squarely in two. When the illusions die, ours or the Brazilians, it is a rude awakening. Brazil is in danger. The threat is breakdown and potentially and in part communism. A flabby giant is trying to lift itself by its bootstraps. The straps tend to break. Brazil's spirit and her politics are democratic. Her economic system is not. And her kindly people are no longer. We can help Brazil, but we have not the power or the right to make it over. Nor has Russia the power to make it over her way. Brazil is for Brazilians. God, and under her new policies, the U.S. government, help those who help themselves. This is Eric Severide. Good night. CBS Reports, Brazil, The Rude Awakening, was edited and produced by the staff of CBS Reports under the supervision and control of CBS News.